People seem to forget, if you change today, today will change your life. Hi, Matt. How are you doing? Wonderful. It's great to be with you, David. Yeah, it's, great to, yeah, it's great to be with you, Matt, as well. And, uh, and uh, great to be chatting with you. And obviously, you're on the other side of the world. So how are you dealing with all the self-isolating at the moment? How's it, how's it going for you? I'm not really sure it's different for anyone anywhere in the world. We, <laughs> we could be anywhere. I just see I am in this glass bubble. I'm, I feel like a mime trying to find my way out. Um, no, doing my best to compensate and, uh, and, and keep a good balance with uh, what we're adapting to. Good. Yeah, good. So glad to hear it. And uh, yeah, we've all got our own ways of trying to keep ourselves entertained and keep connected and all of that stuff. And we're all, we're all trying to go through it the best way we can. And that's why I'm really excited to have you on because... I think between your book and, and some of the conversation that we've had, you've probably got, probably got some really interesting ideas in terms of how people can use this as, a, as an opportunity to actually chain, you know, look after themselves, take care of themselves and really understand themselves whilst they've got this extra time. So, but before we get into any of that, Matt, for those of people who might not be familiar, just tell us a little bit more about yourself. Thank you. Well, uh, I am here uh, very close to Philadelphia uh, in, uh, in the East U.S., and I uh, have always been from this area. I went to Temple University, uh, which is the, the big university here. Um, graduated in journalism and went into the field of marketing and public relations for about 10 or 15 years and started my own company in that field in 2002 and did that for a few years until I went into the, the world of the nonprofit and uh, internships is something and apprenticeships, you know, by yeah. the same name there. Uh, and I've done that for now about 15 years and i'm in my my next chapter here with uh with the book excellent and um and so what was um you know i noticed in one of the places uh, reading your various pieces of work you know you had a real desire to be a difference maker right and i i'm always curious when people use phrases like difference maker or they want to talk they really want to contribute to the world or they want to share something or they want to give more time or resources or uh, skills or whatever it is, people who that they make a real concerted effort to do that. I'm always curious what that driving force is, because th there is that line. Everyone knows it that the secret to living is giving, and yet most people don't necessarily start with that. Most people don't, you know, they're taking care of all the things around them first. So, what was the driving force for you to want to be a difference maker? You know, I I've uh, actually done some self reflection about that more recently. <laughs> You've got a lot and, of time, yeah. Yeah, well, that's there's that, and and you know, where is the root of it? And uh, you know, it's always been a driving force for me. And you know, I can I can joke just a bit about uh, one of my early jobs. I actually was a, I was a dough master at Pizza Hut. Oh right. Yeah, I was 16 years old, so some time ago, and uh, there I was, uh, you know, in the in the early hours trying to make new kinds of pizza right? Things that Pizza Hut isn't selling yet, but that's the difference I wanted to make, you know, way back then. Uh, it, it's just always been something that's mattered to me. And uh, I, it certainly drove me into the, the field of internships and always going back and uh, speaking to the, uh, the emerging professionals and, and just doing what I, I can to help and involved in uh, veteran transition and things of that nature. And it, it just evolved to the point where where you know now the the book uh, is is that vehicle for me and i'm I'm just so grateful to have the opportunity yeah and uh, and on, and on that sort of supporting um veteran transition i mean everyone during this period i've been saying to a lot of people with this coronavirus stuff that a lot of this is really about what time is this happening in your life and for some people it's it's at an okay time they can deal with it they can handle it and other people, they're going through these big transitions or maybe as a result of everything going on, they're going through a transition. And one of the things I was really curious to get your opinion on is, you know, a veteran transition is about as hard a transition as anything, isn't it? And uh, not that I have any experience in that area. I would want to get your, your insights in terms of what that looks like. And maybe you've got some ideas in terms of people transitioning whilst it might be a, a totally different situation how people who might be going through a transition right now, how they might be able to cope with that and find it a little bit easier based on maybe some insights you have around helping people transition in the hardest sense. So is there anything that you can share? Firstly, just tell us, you know, any kind of stories and insights around what that veteran transition looks like. And then maybe is there any insights in there, little takeaways that people right now could be using if they're going through their own transition? Sure. Thank you. Well, I'd say that 
one of the things around the the veteran transition work I've done had to do with uh, one of the grants that uh, I was able to secure through the internship institute in creating uh, opportunities for them to gain civilian work experience. Sometimes it was while they were still enlisted. Other times it was when they were just coming out. You know, there's no substitute for experience for, you know, for anyone in this way. And for them to try and get a sense of their transferable skills and their interests and, and so forth, the statistics are really not very good. The, the Most of them are, uh, it's very difficult to get that first job. And of course, we're talking about a job market that's, that's uh, shifted quite a bit in, in, uh, in recent years and up until now, but uh, they're out of that job typically within a year, year and a half that even once they secure it. So there's uh, a lot of factors depending on their experiences. It could be PTSD mm -hmm. uh, as, as one factor and just another of trying to get their footing. Generally speaking to your question for anyone who is in transition, and this goes also, I, I could speak quite um, you know, quite pointedly to the college student as well, are that there are certain techniques that are really put the control in, into the hands of the individual. And I, I think that's really most important because a lot of us experience that you're just trying to throw something against the wall to make it stick, or you're trying to respond to some internet post uh, of a job uh, description and, oh, I'll never hear from that one again. And, and that's very typical. And, and yet there I think I believe the reality. I don't know the exact statistic on this, David, but I do believe most most jobs are secured through networking. Yeah, and yeah, I that. and so you know, LinkedIn, for example, is is a great tool for that and, and a great way to pinpoint. Well, either who do I want to be or who do I want to meet, uh, and 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 those sorts of things. And so it's a it's a it's it's a it's a more um, it's a it's a less confrontational way, I guess, just to get your out yourself out there and and uh, and introduce yourself to somebody. And I'm an advocate of the informational interview, uh, especially for uh, college students, but really anyone in transition. And it can be certainly now as easy as doing it on Zoom, like you said, people have time on their hands. It's a good time to reach out and introduce yourself to somebody. Maybe it's necessary to have to pivot right now and look at some career explorations. Uh, who can you find on LinkedIn uh, to, to learn about the career and, and their daily life uh, in, in doing those sorts of things? Reach out, ask for a virtual cup of coffee in this very time. Uh, and if someone doesn't spend that time with you, then it's their loss, mm -hmm. right? Or that's not somebody who you wanna spend time with, right? So you have to just you know frame and put yourself and value yourself in that way. And it's on to the next person, right? So having those conversations and networking in that way, they may or may not be that right individual. They could become a mentor. They could become someone who would introduce you to other people uh, as, a, as a warmer introduction to have more of the same conversations and just keep doing more of the same. It'll be self-educational. It'll keep you connected with, with new people and, and bring those new experiences. And if you keep doing things like that, it, it will lead you to where you belong, even if you don't know where that is right now. I think that's a, that's a, that's a really, a lot of really uh, good, good, good advice and really good practical steps for people to say. I totally agree. And I think one of the points you made up, it's a phrase I use very, very commonly, is that idea of warming up. And, you know, if I, it, when, I te when I work with people in sales, part of it is, you know, anyone who, before they become a client, they'll have seen maybe an ad of mine, then I might have seen a, a piece of content, then they might have scheduled a call with me. And then by that point, there's so much warming up that's been done that they're warmed up to the idea of, okay, I know who David is and, and whether I want to work with him or not. And, and so that's always part of the process. And exactly what you said, in whether people go through LinkedIn or however they might connect to, to take very actionable steps to, to ease transition is, you don't always have to go straight in with the ask or straight in with a suggestion or expect the other person to go for it. And I, I've used this phrase quite recently that I think all forms of communication are typically one of two E's, empathy or expectation. Right. And a lot of this is that if we go in straight with expectation, then actually you're going to, most people put their walls up. Most people will put their walls up and say no, or they'll say I can't or not the right time or whatever. If there's a way to lead with empathy, and that might be exactly like you've said in terms of just creating that, that warmer environment to, to actually open the door and let them walk through the door and feel welcomed to that, I totally agree with that sentiment. So I think that's a really, really good piece of advice.
Thank you. You know, there's, I'm not sure I can come up with an E on this point, but uh, cu <laughs> curiosity, uh, and, and I, I think a lot of people might not be familiar with informational interviews, so I'll, I'll just take another moment to, to, to clarify. And through the nonprofit, I do have a couple free sites that are very near and dear, uh, if I may mention them, that Please, might be yeah. a good resource to people. Uh, one is studentsteps.org, and another is vetsteps.org for veterans. Very much the same. Uh, platform, some additional, uh, isol you know, selective resources that are exclusive for veterans on, on the other site, but they're pretty much the same. Mm -hmm. It asks your email address. Quite honestly, I do nothing with them. <laughs> you'll never, <laughs> you'll never be spammed by me, but you'll go in and it'll give you uh, those, those sample questions. And to, to your point, you're not going in with an expectation. You're, you're leading with curiosity. You're, you're asking true informational interview questions that are, you know, it, it's also about you. I mean, you have to go in with an expectation. This probably just might not be right for me, but I'm going mm. to meet somebody who's going to give me some insight. And if it's a pleasant surprise, then it leads to them asking you for uh, a resume as a follow-up or something like that. Hey, that's great, but that's not really your primary intention going in. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, yeah, primary intention. I think that's a very good case. Okay, so bef before I forget, uh, Matt. So just get, just for anyone who missed that. So uh, what were the two? What were the two um, uh, sites that you were just referred to? So you said Vet Steps, and what was the other one? Uh, studentsteps.org. Student so so yeah. even if you're not a college student yeah. or uh, in school in any way, uh, the the technique. In, in terms of what's described yeah. and the resources in some ways are, are going to be of value. Excellent. Okay. So I just wanted to make sure that people, yeah, def people definitely heard that. And uh, yeah, it sounds, it sounds like really, really useful tools. And speaking of useful tools, I, I want to now get onto your book, Zedisms, which I just, I mean, the title alone, I spent, I spent, a, I spent um, a good amount of time trying to think of all the isms I could think of um, and all the different words that are isms. And I was wondering wh where it might go, but, have been looking at the different sections and a, a lot of crossover with what I do, but I wanted to talk about some of the areas that I thought had a good, a, a very good crossover with the this, this madness we're all going through right now, and it just creates this really odd, strange uh, level playing field. And yes, we a lot of uh, social boundaries have you know have gone up. Sorry, a lot of um, a lot of boundaries in terms of our uh, being able to connect with people have gone up. But actually, in, in, a, in a weird reverse way, we're actually more connected than ever, than ever. Right. I always speak to, I speak to a lot of people who might feel lonely and isolated and say, well, actually, this is such a unique position where you get to learn how to cope with this because everyone at some point in their life will have to learn how to deal with that loneliness and isolation, knowing that everyone else is feeling it at exactly the same time. Most people, when they go through it, they feel very alone, that like they're the only one experiencing it. Right. For anyone who's experiencing it right now who's listening, you get to know that you are by far not the only person feeling it. And I would just want to get some of Matt's, Matt's advice, really, and some of his practical steps in terms of what people can be doing. Uh, and one of the things I wanted to talk about first was swimming with the current. Hmm. Right, because I, I think a lot of people are still seeing this as a crisis, and it's awful, and it's difficult, and it's a struggle. But rather than seeing it as a crisis, I think a lot of us, unfortunately, we have to see it as the new norm because it's going to be like this for a while, right. almost accepting that this is the environment now. And once we accept a, a situation in life rather than sort of, you know, excuse my French, bullshitting in terms of it's not like this, it's, it's, it's going to be sorted, all of this, da, da, da. F from that place, you can't really create the next steps. You can't really create the ideas of, well, what am I going to do? Once we kind of accept what maybe the reality and the norm is, right, from that place, okay, so it's difficult. This might be the norm for a while. What am I going to do from, from, from this place? And a big part of that is understanding how to swim with the current. And for that, Matt, I wanted to go to you in terms of just talking a little bit about what that looks like and what that section of the book looks like and how people can actually learn to swim with the current. Sure. Yeah, you know, first, I think you made some, very, some amazing points. I hadn't considered myself about how we all are in this common place in life, right? We, we have this common uh, thread with what we're all trying to adapt to and, and, and make the best of, if you will. And uh, it does point to the, to the part of the book about swimming with the current, which is about midway through, you know, we're talking about personal mm -hmm. development and then into interpersonal. And now it's, you're really into that uh, intuitive uh, and, and just, smart practical decisions around swimming with swimming with the current so the beginning of that 
is really about experience and trusting your gut and the general sense, uh, which is uh, a bit visceral, but in, in unique to the individual, but it's that experience of when you feel yourself swimming upstream, whatever it is in life, it's like, oh, I'm banging my head against the wall about this or uh, try, try again, or the, you know, I'm pushing a rock up a hill, it's going to fall back, roll back down on me. That feeling, you really have to stop and ask yourself, what does it mean to turn around and go the other way? That, I like that. Right. So uh, that's just uh, that's some hard living that went into <laughs> get to that experience because uh, I've definitely done my share of swimming and my arms have gotten tired mm -hmm. quite a bit. You know, another, uh, before coming specifically to your point, has a lot to do with relationships. In that chapter, I'm talking about my wife, <laughs> my relationship. Right, right. Um, I'm second go around and you know, part of what I've found in, in the health of a marriage is to know who the current is in every, in any given time. Uh, it's, uh, it's important, David, if you, if you haven't learned this lesson, um, who's, you know, who's better, who's better at what, who owns what, um, who, who covers for the other where it's a weakness. So, um, you know, we're into the domestic version of, uh, of, of what makes uh, a relationship work. But for example, my, my wife, Erica, she, she can't stand making a service provider calls like to the telephone company or, you know, you name it. And any of those kinds of things to the bank, like she'll, she'll go from zero to madness in about four seconds flat. <laughs> so uh, I have a little bit of a reservoir of patience with those kinds of things. And that's, you know, I, you know, this is my department, right? Okay. So yeah. choose your departments and then pick your battles. That's the other part of it mm. too. Now back to the, uh, the, the, the circumstance that we're in and it's easy just to put our heads in the sand about things that we don't want to deal with but the reality is how do you turn what is a difficulty into an opportunity that's the question to ask because you're if, if you're facing just the difficulty then you're just going to get washed over by by the current and it, there are the you know proverbial you know one door closes and the other door opens mm -hmm. and those kinds of things but it it's it's valid here mm -hmm. and you know what is that uh, so, and, you know, we talked about some of that in a career sense and, and exploring it. Uh, there's also the aspect of, you know, we're calling it social distancing, but I think it's about physical distancing because we're social creatures. And I think social distancing is about the last thing we should be doing right now in terms of isolating mm -hmm. and really having the opportunity to reach out, uh, do, uh, you know, I've, I've had uh, conversations with uh, college friends that I haven't connected with in, in years and years and hopping on these party calls and having a, you know, what you'd say a pint. I would, we don't say pints here typically. <laughs> we do say uh, pint, yeah. You say pints. Yeah. But, uh, but, but yes, what are those opportunities? How can you turn it into a positive? And, and uh, that's not to, to, to put aside the difficulties that, that are they're absolute, absolutely real uh, and that there, there really is no other way but through. Mm -hmm. I really, really like that. And, uh, and yeah, I, I, th I think I, just the, just the sentiment of that is, is brilliant. And it's, you know, you used every kind of cliche and analogy in terms of banging your head against the wall and all of those things which everyone can relate to, but are just the realities and, you know, understanding that, you know, you could, having the right strategy is so important. And we'll, we'll get onto a little bit of maybe the stuff before swimming against the current, uh, sorry, swimming with the current in terms of actually maybe people are going to break their pattern first, they've got to shift their mindset and everything else. We'll get onto that in a minute. But actually, some, so many people, they kind of force themselves and force themselves and force themselves to go in a particular, right, particular direction, just when in reality, it just you can't go that way. And right. actually understanding, okay, well, how do I use my environment rather than fight it? Because you can't fight the environment, right? You, you lose every time. But, and the idea that we can control everything, my, my thing is always we, we can't control all the events, but we can control what they mean. Hmm. And actually understanding that meaning and understanding that alone gives us a real sense of certainty and control rather than looking to the environment for our certainty and control, which if that's where you get your certainty from, you're going to feel very uncertain a lot of the time, right. especially right now. So I think that's a really, really good point. And so I, wonder, I really, I really like that. Yeah. And you're right. I think that might've been 
uh, the the most the record for the most cliches and metaphors mixed <laughs> into one run-on sentence at a time. I'm gonna have to pull back on that probably. <laughs> no, we've all got different. We've all got the different ones, haven't we? And and the thing is that people, when I ever talk to people about cliches and things like that, people kind of you know like nod along and kind of they know it intellectually. The reason why they're cliches is because often they're just very good ways of describing something, and people know these things intellectually. But as we're talking about today, how do you actually you know, it's what, if you don't put it into practice, you don't really know it. You know it intellectually, but you don't really know it if you're not putting it into practice. So, uh, no, your, your cliches were all, all absolutely relevant. And, I, and so to be able to swim with the current in the first place and, and knowing what those steps are and what that strategy is and what that action plan might be, and we've mentioned some of those steps, I always think really importantly, the first part of that is you've got to do it through the, the right state or the right filter. The way you see the world has to be, you know, at your best as possible. So I wanted to talk about minding the mood scale. Sure. Because, you know, in terms of that mental health aspect, there are a lot of people, a lot of my clients, a lot of other people, people listening to this podcast, I know, uh, and friends and family who this is just such a unique situation that they just, many people just aren't designed, you know, to, to have this, to be in this place. And a lot of people think it's them, whereas actually, and I'm sure you would think of it in the same way is we all have a survival brain, don't we? We have a brain that's designed to help us survive, not make us happy. And mm -hmm. back way back when, when we're supposed to have a, you know, a community and tribe to survive, right? Now that's not the case anymore because we've got enough comfort. So we can be isolated and survive, but our brain still acts as a, you know, a siren goes off saying, you have to be around people. You have to be around people. And that's what people are struggling. And I always talk about is that piece of the brain called the limbic, which is that, that where that that alarm goes off but in terms of managing uh that, their mental health but really the way you describe it minding the mood scale i'm just curious as to as to a bit more what that looks like to you sure so it, you use the right word and and we have in in common in in, in the the mood being one of them is around filters and uh for example and i'd like to touch on for just a moment the one of the first ones in, in the first chapter is called earned confidence and uh, and they all string together. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a longer answer. Yeah, please. I'll no, certainly, good I'll certainly hone in. Um, when we talk about earned confidence, the fact is that it, it's a reminder that wherever we are in our in our lives, younger or otherwise, mm -hmm. uh, we've been through and have overcome everything up until this point. Right? We're still standing. We're right here. And and so it's it's a great reminder that we have that earned confidence to know we're going to be able to and will handle everything that comes our way. So things like worrying unnecessarily and anxiety or stress around things that have yet to happen is, is not necessary because of the earned confidence. And don't we have enough happening right now in dealing with the real to just focus on that? So that's, that's one thing is as a filter to make sure that you're grounded and you're staying present and, uh, and, and just dealing in the moment, because if your mind is racing with these other things unnecessarily, you're already uh, distorting uh, that. And then we also, of course, talk about perception it, it, itself and, and how between the likes of an earned confidence and your mood health uh, affecting that. And uh, we can come back to perception a little bit, but the fact is, is we have so much information flowing through our heads all the mm -hmm. time, and we take it in in very different ways, and we interpret it as the truth when in fact it really is only an interpretation. Yeah. And, yeah. and so we have to, to give ourselves the benefit of the doubt of the things that we're experiencing and we're being hard on ourselves. And, you know, is that really accurate? And, uh, and if to whatever degree it is, still just be kind to yourself, right? And then uh, over to, to mood health, which you're right, is just so essential. And, you know, the book, when you, when you talk about isms, I, I think the, the impression is I have all these quips, all these, you know, cliches, right? And I, I haven't set the right impression about that quite yet. But the book is really, it's a book and, and there are these call outs. And it's, it's written in a way that I'm having a personal conversation with the reader. And I thought it was important to also disclose certain things throughout uh, for the first time that had been very private. And one of which is that I have contended with depression since my early teens and uh it's you know once you know once you have that uh you uh you know never it's never anything you can ignore mm. you have to you have to factor it into your daily living and and it's a it's a constant uh it's a constant part of of self-management and so 
uh, just pulling back from that for the moment, I think a lot of people uh, are, are experiencing that right now uh, in one way, shape or form and not sure what to, what to do about it. And when we have it in the, uh, in the way it's framed, we look at it on this scale as, as if it's a, a thermometer. And if you imagine in the, in the, and there's a visual here, but it's not hard to describe audibly, that there's a, a, a perfect balance in the center. And then there's kind of a normal range if whoever, however you want to define normal, whatever that is, mm -hmm. no one gets to really say that. Yeah. Uh, but there's that normal happy, that normal sad for you. And, and, and then there's the start dipping below normal sad for whatever reason. And it's, it's very much like, I experience it like it's quicksand. And hmm. the, the first part of that is really, you don't even know that you're sinking. And those, those of us who uh, have even experienced low, low level depression um, know that feeling that even months can go by and then suddenly uh, it's spring or something like that. And you feel so much better and you realize, wow, I was not really myself all these months and not even, not even knowing it. But I think we're dealing with some things now that, that people are, are going to find it easier to sink deeper. And for me, uh, one of the things that I do is I, I look to uh, a three-day rule to manage myself. Oh, okay. Um, you know, we're always going to have our down days, whether it's the weather or an event of some kind, and we might string a couple of them together. But for me, if I get to a third day, uh, I have to take action. Uh, things like structuring my time, uh, making sure I'm not laying around, I'm, I'm moving, uh, exercise is the absolute number one for me. And, you know, if you talk about how hard it is to get yourself to do that, and we all talk about that quite often, if yeah. we're not into it already, it's even harder uh, when you're, uh, when you're trying to pull out before you sink, uh, when it, before the quicksand gets above your knees. You know, I think a lot of people dance around this topic, and I'm not really, you know, the stigma around it, I'm not really sure why. And, and whether it's my personal experience, or the fact that it's just a common thread through some of the things that just come up in the book, you know, that mood health as a filter is, is we, I think all of us to some degree have experienced it. And if it's not us individually, I, I can't imagine any of us have ever had, uh, you know, are without a family member or a close friend who've been through a mental health event. Hmm. And yet we separate it. Um, it's part of physical health, right? But mental health is a medical condition. Your brain actually is part of your body. I think people, I think people kind of forget that <laughs> at times. Um, yeah. So, uh, so there really is no division. I, I think that this is a, the right time to, um, to, to take it head on if there was any other. Um, and the last thing I'll say here, and I, this is just a, a, a more recent thought and seeing how various uh, pivots have had to occur. And one of which is that the, uh, the mental health providers, the medical providers for this purpose, um, have had to also go virtual. And so it's a lot more accessible than mm. it really ever has been. The idea of that barrier of, oh, I'm going to have to make an appointment with that witch doctor or whatever, you know, stigma there is, and then go to some office and be on a couch. Um, that That's not right now. Yeah. And so to, to think of, uh, it, it's a lot easier to get that kind of help. And uh, I'll say, um, you know, another disclosure in the book, and I'm, I'm the youngest of four in, in, in 2012, my brother, David, uh, who had a challenge with opioids decided to, you know, he checked out and, uh, you know, to, to prevent that, um, you know, number one, the one thing I'll say to, to those who are feeling truly depressed uh, is that you, there might be some reality to the reasons for that, but things won't always feel this way things won't always be this bad, right? Brighter days are ahead. And it's, it's easy to lose sight of that when you're feeling that way. And if you're even that much lower uh, and you really feel as though you're, you're having some challenges uh, keeping yourself safe and reach out. Um, and, and, and it's accessible uh, to, to get that telehealth now more than it ever has before. And, and just be kind to yourself because um, whether you might believe it or not, you, I'm sure you deserve it, right? Oh, th well, firstly, thank you so much for your cancer, Matt. And I'm sure that's just a lot of what you said just felt very empowering to me, but I'm sure, I'm sure it was the case for a lot of people listening as well. And, uh, the, the, uh, talking on the kind of the the a bit of the um, the opportunity to be able to reach out to mental health experts. Now, when I saw the numbers and statistics in terms of how much of it was not done online, how much was not available online, and how everything was almost 
in person paperwork what it, i could i just couldn't believe it and this is a shift that's needed to happen not without having known the numbers as soon as i saw the numbers this is a shift that had should have happened a long long time ago that right. actually it's way way more accessible to people so if anything this is a, a real um you know similar to how you, you look at um pictures of of the um earth from above and actually how the environment has changed and the benefits it's had on the earth and the environment i think in a similar way that actually when it comes to things like mental health and actually having to restructure how that works and how we look and take care of people and yeah there are obviously sort of certain downsides to to being online compared to face to face and everything else of course there are but if we can reach out and help more and more people then maybe more and more people will feel comfortable and i think any kind of mental health thing is one of those things that most people just think they look at someone who's depressed and they go, you know, and if they, if they've not understood it yet. And when I say yet, because at some point likely they will with some sort of experience, Oh, it's, they feel sad or okay. They feel this way. And actually any of that sort of stuff, it's, it's not that it's scary, right? right? It's scary. And it's the same thing for isolation. It's scary. It's scary to be in that place. And it's scary to feel like you're the only one who feels that it's really empowering when you talk about it because so many people listening saying yes, exactly. Either, you know, in terms of the percentage of people who will say either I have felt that I am feeling that, or they sort of accept that maybe at some point I will feel that because we, as I said, we can't control the events. Then it's going to be a very, very, very high percentage of people. And actually rather than sort of acting as if we're this uh, strong uh, kind of, I say strong inverted commas because we think it's strong, strong insular people who can protect themselves from feeling any negative thoughts or going through a difficult time or anything else. If, the, if people try and pretend that's the reality, they're actually, in, it's going to be a much, much harder to deal with. Right. When actually understanding like this is okay. And the three day rule you mentioned, I think, I think Steve Jobs spoke similarly about with his business where he would say, if something, if for three days, it's sort of, the idea has, something hasn't progressed or it hasn't changed or whatever, or he, he within himself as a CEO or leader feels the same way, mm-hmm. then actually he knew he had to make some sort of shift. I think that's a really good way of looking at it, where it's to, to sort of almost allow yourself the bad moments, okay? Because I, I got into a place where I like to think, and it, you know, of course I've had bad days, of course I will have bad days, but I, I now have the attitude of, I don't have a bad day. I have very, 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 or well, I have had very bad moments, but as much as possible that, that somehow that doesn't turn into a bad day. Now, there will be bad days inevitably. So it's not a hard and fast rule to say, I can't have bad days, but to allow yourself to know that if you have bad moments, that's fine. That's a part sure. of life. That's okay. And when you talk about the perception, the filter, what I find interesting about that is I always look at it as exactly what you said. It's the perception. So if, if anyone listening is thinking about actually If I look back to a memory or a moment in my life, I'm not looking back at the moment itself. I'm looking back at how I saw the moment. I'm looking back at how I saw the event. And therefore, how we define the moment at the time is incredibly important to how we think about in the future. Now, that doesn't mean to act really positive about it. That doesn't mean to to say, oh, this isn't happening, whatever. But when we have those bad moments, if we can find ways to define it, to control the meaning of it, and, and find a way that there's a lesson. We find a way that there's an opportunity. We find a way that there's growth. We find a way that actually I'm going through this experience again. It will give me some strength again in the future because I know I'll learn how to deal with this. Then when we go back to, and reflect on it and remember it, actually, right. we, we do it through that place. So I think that what you're saying really, really, really makes sense. And, um, and so the, the, the thing that I've, I'm very passionate about, and you mentioned about fitness and things like that. So I know that you've got a section of your book about energy. And I always say energy is the oxygen to confidence, right? You, if your energy is up, you're going to feel confident, you're going to feel better at yourself and everything else. I would, I'd love to know a bit more about uh, how you've gone about in terms of enhancing and keeping your energy up and increasing that energy. Because I think everyone right now is looking for more energy. Sure. But actually, any practical steps others can take right now? Yeah. And, uh, and, and also just to, uh, respond to some of the things you said, I, I think you were spot on as well. And, and it is easy, uh, to ignore ourselves in terms of what we're experiencing right now. And you know what being scared is, is normal. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and, and we are at, at, to 
a certain degree you know, grieving over the, the loss of the joys that we're sure, used to, sure. right? So uh, I don't think that's something to turn your back on, but there are ways to, to compensate for them. And that certainly does have uh, a lot to, and, 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 and look, you know, with respect, uh, there are lots of people out there right now dealing with true grief. Yeah, and, absolutely. Uh, and, you know, again, it's, it's, it's necessary and it's unfortunate and there is no other way but through that, that difficult time as, as to whatever degree that, that term applies to anything that we go through. As far as the energy goes, you know, really look at this a couple of different ways. One is, uh, you know, part of, of mood health is physical health. And mm -hmm. I think the things that we all know about, uh, with uh, physical exercise and, and a regiment of, of, you know, sound sleep and eating right and hydrating and, and reducing stress, right? Those are the, those are what the big four are. And I do, you know, I have some different tools, one of which is this, uh, um, self-care report card. It's like an accountability tool. Right. Um, I, and I know we'll get to it and you'll have it in the show notes, but it, I do offer it for also for free on the, on the website. And, uh, and that's just a simple way to, to kind of keep tabs on yourself. Now, when we go into managing energy and that whole, that whole chapter, that starts swaying us back into what we were talking about before about swimming with the current and, and that trusting of your gut and, and a, a higher, a greater mindfulness about both our own internal energy at any given time and how we manage ourselves and our energy. Um, I don't know. Have you ever sat in front of the computer and tried to write the same sentence for about an hour? <laughs> yes. um, that's probably a better time to do laundry, right? So, <laughs> so that, you know, that self-management is part of it. Another has to do with the personal responsibility we have around it, not only with ourselves, but with others. So when you think about things like, I'll just reflect back to earned confidence because that is one of the, that is kind of the foundation and the theme that, that ties throughout the book and, and worrying is, is another aspect of that. And worrying again is a, an expectation of something that you don't want to happen, mm. which is, you know, if we, we go further along into the, into the law of attraction and things like that, you'll, you know, we will we'll reflect on why that's a really bad idea. Uh, but when, when we worry, when we're, uh, experiencing any kind of negative, uh, you know, there's a transference to uh, that energy. And one of the examples, well, let's put it this way. If you're, if you're worrying and you're leaning on someone else about something that you're worrying about unnecessarily, now you're imposing that negative energy on them too. Yeah. Right? Right, so yeah. that's, that's part of what we're talking about with managing energy as well. As far as keeping my energy up, I'm, I don't know. I'm kind of an energetic guy. It's just kind of somewhat of, a, of, an, of an innate thing. Uh, I think positivity to a large degree is a learned trait. And uh, you have to work on it the same as, as any muscle. Um, yeah, you know, I, I think the one thing that I talk about with energy transference uh, is, is like if you're out, and this isn't the, today's example, but let's say that you're out with your friends and you're having a great time, you go to a restaurant and you encounter... Um, uh, a server who is in not the greatest mood and you know, they're flipping you an attitude. And the next thing you know, they walk away and you're all ticked off about it. Hopefully not all of you or any of you were ticked off about it, but what just happened was that energy transference, right? You were just having cool. a great time and now someone else has, you know, soured you. So for example, um, you know, I've remained conscious of this for, for many years and my son, Jake, who, uh, who's 19 now, you know, we're always out, you know, I'm not the best cook or, you know, I heat things in a microwave. So he, he's seen a lot of dinners out at times. And so it's not an unusual thing to encounter somebody who's not in the best mood. And we make a conscious effort to, uh, to cheer them up, to make them smile, to, like to, uh, it's a nice way to, um, you know, it's a, it's an, it's an all around win. So, uh, you know, they, they don't have to know that you're going out of your way to cheer them up, but it's certainly a nice way to pay it forward. <laughs> Well, when, when it comes to transference, uh, are you someone that feels it a lot or are you someone that actually it sort of brushes past you quite well? Because some people I speak to that just transference, just everything lands on them and other people, it just, it just sort of goes past them. So from your point of view in terms of transference, how, how easily do you cope with other people's, let's say, attitude or behavior? Well, I think it begins with someone trusting themselves and know to know or uh you know not to care what other people think yeah, and yeah, it's, it, yeah. it starts there you know how much are you going to let someone dent or penetrate your armor in that way and uh being kind and respecting yourself uh starts with uh with 
with not letting other people and, and whatever their issues are uh, for whatever reason uh, that they're, uh, that they're, they're putting negativity toward you that you're going to receive it in a, in a um, legitimate way that, that you give it value. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, if, if, can I sidebar over to another a part, another yeah. chapter here? Yeah. And it's funny because this is the one it's called be aware of spiders. And this is the one that I almost did not include in the book because it, it's more of a cautionary uh, example. And it, it's almost like which one of these doesn't go with the other, right? Because the book is meant to, you know, personal development and uplifting, but it's just one of, the, it's another one of those aspects of hard living that I was like, I've learned this and I really feel like it has to be there. And it's true that uh, it, we're always so many moving parts, both within ourselves and trying to figure other people out. And this is somewhat of a Malcolm Gladwell kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. um, okay. If you like Malcolm Gladwell, Rhonda yeah. Byrne, you know, kind of intersects here. Um, that there are two kinds of people in the world, that there are spiders and there are people who get caught in webs. And what we're talking about is that there are people who have that character trait that they will make a, a conscious effort to manipulate another person. You're either someone who will do that or you won't. And it, it might only be 1% of the time uh, and it might be, I'll only do that to someone in my work environment and never to my family. But that still makes that person, in effect, a spider or a manipulator. It doesn't make them a bad person. I'm not going to debate the nature versus nurture of it. But it's important to know that. And I, I think what I've found, that, you know, the book's only been out a few weeks. And, and to my surprise, a lot of people are coming back to me, you know, talking about this like oh you know i can relate and there are people in my life yes yes uh and and it's one of those things that just to raise your awareness in, in both your own energy and and in in, in your self-preservation to be able to just have the the patience and even the 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 empathy and compassion to insulate yourself and and recognize you know someone might just be this way but you're not gonna you're not gonna take it you're gonna you're gonna stand there and hold your ground you don't feel the need to get aggressive with them. You're just not going to be manipulated. Mm -hmm. And, and that's a good feeling. So I guess the best example here, David, is if, if you're listening to this and you're someone who has a hard time saying no, if you're like, I really need to say no, that's because you are allowing yourself to be manipulated by people. And then the worst part of that is when you don't say no, you feel horrible about yourself <laughs> for whatever it is that you're now doing that you wish you hadn't said uh, that you wish you hadn't said no to. So say yeah, say no. I, I might have gotten that wrong just now for the second. I think you got the point. Say uh, no uh, and uh, and and you know take pride in in doing that and build on that and 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 that self respect. And I think that I know that that was. Uh, a long part to come back to the answer to your question, but it's just so applicable mm. to the point about whether or not you, you let other people's actions and energies, you know, bounce off you or roll off your shoulders as part of your self-protection. And it's not like you have to go around all the time being on guard either. Who wants to do that? Mm. But just being mindful of it and who it is that you're interacting with and, and stay within your own, your own space and, and, and not, not wonder after the fact what just happened. I, I love that analogy. And actually, that re it's, 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 it's interesting you brought that up. I, I, made a, I made a rule for myself, I think uh, maybe I was about 18 at the time, where having gone through some tough experiences and, uh, and tough sort of uh, uh, connections with people and things like that, I actually made a decision that except for a handful of people, maybe four or five people close to me in my life, I would care what people think, but I wouldn't care of what they thought of me. Right. And I always think you have to really have a, a genuine caring for how people think and feel, but their opinion of you is sort of none of your business, really. That's just their opinion. And actually being up for me, it was a way to kind of differentiate between the two where I didn't want to feel like I was heartless in the sense of I didn't care about anything. I just want to care about that, you know, because there's that, there's that saying of hurt people hurt people. And when I talk about empathy and expectation, I always, you know, if, if someone is to be critical in any way is to understand, well, actually, what might their motivation be? And is it purely to do with me or is there 
do it can i have the empathy to maybe understand that there's other things going on that is part of the equation it's always part you know how we respond is always part of an equation it's not just always one stimulus it's it's a combination of things and understanding that you know let's think about actually well what do they what are they worrying about what do they think what do they feel and that that's probably what got me into coaching and probably similarly what got you into 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 helping people as well and uh, and you mentioned something a little bit earlier and I wrote it down because I was so curious as to, as to where you were going with it. You mentioned about the law of attraction and maybe your opinion on the law of attraction. Uh, I've got my own opinion in terms of, I think a lot of people misunderstand what the law of attraction is. And if I, you know, the amount of conversations I have with people for the first time where they go, well, I thought really hard about this thing and it didn't happen. And I was like, well, you, then you don't, right. understand, you don't understand what the law of attraction is, but you mentioned it and you mentioned, so I'm just curious sure. as to what your approach to that is. Sure. So, uh, just as a, just a, a general overview, you know, after we get through the swimming with the current and we yeah. talk, we have some fun with making coincidences matter and 11, 11, and some of those experiences with synchronicity that you might have. And that leads us into the area of amplifying gratitude and whether you want to call it law of attraction or whether you just want to call it life enrichment, you know, it's a very well scientifically based fact that being rooting yourself in gratitude and being present with it is what life enrichment is, is all about. And, uh, and so start there. But the law of attraction um, essentially, in my view, comes down to uh, summarizing that what we expect tends to happen. That's, you know, you talk, talk about, about expectations. And um, the, uh, the, when I referenced back to the, the whole aspect of earned confidence and not worrying, and when you say, well, when you worry, you're creating an expectation of things you don't want to happen. Well, if there is some legitimacy, and I obviously believe that there is, to the law of attraction, and the fact that what you expect tends to happen, then that makes it possible that you worrying about something is actually becoming the cause mm. of something happening, yeah. Yeah. whether that's to you or, or even worse, if you're worried about someone else. So just keep that in mind. If you believe in the law of attraction and you're a worrier, you're contradicting yourself. That's a very good point. That's a very so, good point. So, uh, so, so building on that, we talk about things being practical. So for entrepreneurs, for example, the law of attraction is not going to make something big happen. Right? Like a book doesn't write itself. Mm -hmm. right? These are things that are effortful. But when you get into aspects of applying the law of attraction in and around what we're talking about, an area called inevitability, it's really getting very clear about your why, about your purpose and the things that you want to achieve. And uh, you had asked me before we started about the, you know, writing the book and I asked myself, well, what would I regret not doing? Right? And kind of defining my why. And the book was you know, right to the surface. I like, yeah, yeah, I better get this done. And, and now, yeah, it's, it's been a year and it's been very effortful, but I couldn't be more happy to have the opportunity to, and, and be the fulfilling to be able to make a difference uh, with this. I, I, I just couldn't be more grateful uh, for, uh, for being here with you. Well, well, you're, well you're very welcome. And I, 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 firstly, to again, say that, I really, really appreciate uh, your your open and honesty, and I think vulnerability is the ultimate form of strength. And within that, I, I think you, you know your book will provide even more with regards to that. And before we talk about actually, well, where can people pick up a copy of it? Is you know to ask the question, what do you really want people to get out of out of the book? Well, I think that at its foundation again is that earned confidence is just a reminder because I think it's a logic filter. Right? It's like, oh yeah, mm. I really have made it through everything I have in my life, right? I am still standing. Like, that's pretty realistic to, to know. And, uh, and it reminds you to stay present where, where life really happens and not get caught up in regret or, or worry and anxiety and rid yourself of those kinds of things. That filter right there is, is key. I think for right now, everything we talked about with mood health and, uh, and, yeah. and the practical examples I hope people come away with and, and to remember that, uh, that to take pride in, in taking care of yourself and reaching out if, you know, if that's something that you need to do, reaching for a friend, staying balanced uh, by, uh, by, by compensating for, for, you know, social lack and things like that. And, and just be kind to yourself. Um, oh, I will say one thing about uh, the, the challenge with Z-isms, 
because here in America, the actual phonetic is Z-ism. <laughs> that is the actual. So I have to be selfish in that way. I, I, I want to be respectful of the Z, still the same letter of the alphabet, <laughs> but, uh, you know, there are insights to live by. And, and my, my hope is that people will uh, just maybe uh, go on to Amazon and, and I'm trying to make the difference here and mm. read the first part of it for free. Mm. And then you'll that's know great. if you want to keep reading. That's, yeah, that's really what it comes down to. So yeah, so Zism or or Zism, that's we <laughs> depending on where you I love think. it. I love um, it. Absolutely. Uh thank you so much for your time, Matt, and absolutely for for people interested in, and I mean there's just just reading the chapter titles alone really to spark your curiosity. And um, Matt has been really kind in terms of sharing his time and uh and and some of the some of the ideas and content and there's a there's a hell of a lot more that we we haven't covered in this in this episode, but maybe we'll have Matt on again in the future. To, to, to talk a little bit more about it but otherwise matt i really appreciate your time and your open and honesty and, and thank you for making a difference to everyone listening of course thank you dave i would love to come back absolutely just I, let me know i'm yeah, back yeah I'm, we can definitely talk some more about it I, yeah. I really enjoyed the conversation and and uh and with your listeners too thank you so much for having me you're welcome